what you'll see here is just really a snapshot of top line results from Project Drawdown's analysis. We ran two different scenarios for the growth of solutions between now and 2050. And that's compared to just a business as usual trajectory. One you might think of as quite ambitious and one you might think of as very, very ambitious. In the first one, you see an emissions impact of almost 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent between 2020 and 2050. That's roughly 25 years worth of current annual emissions. In the second scenario, you see an impact of almost 1,600 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent over 30 years. That's about 40 years worth of current annual emissions. What's interesting with both of these scenarios is that they tell a very similar financial story. There is a sizable, but actually very doable cost to implement solutions. But then we see an incredibly significant savings over time. And that's just if you look at direct cost and direct savings alone. The ROI is super compelling, but it is astronomically higher if we start to add in avoided damages, the health benefits of reducing pollution, et cetera, et cetera. The story here from a financial perspective is really, really clear. What sits beneath these numbers is in some ways a living and evolving map of the global landscape of climate solutions. So let's dig in a little bit deeper at the different sectors and also the subgroups of solutions that sit within them and undergird these two scenarios. We'll do our first kind of double click on reducing sources and the first sector and the largest sector of potential impact of electricity. How do we power the whole world without burning fossil fuels? That's the critical question here. We do it in three basic ways, shifting production away from fossil fuels to wind, solar, geothermal, enhancing the efficiency with which we use electricity so that we reduce demand and quite literally lighten the load, and also improving the system. Uh, the grid is a very 20th century phenomenon. We've got to move towards a flexible, uh, and resilient grid, robust with energy storage, all of that enables clean and renewable energy production. The second sector here is food, agriculture, and land use. The demand for food and for fiber and forest products continues to grow. So the question is, how do we do on land what we do better so that emissions drop and ultimately ecosystems can thrive. That means addressing food waste and shifting diets to less meat and more plants. As you can see, this is a huge opportunity and one we don't hear about nearly enough. Protecting ecosystems so that they can hold on to their carbon in plants and soil. And also shifting our agriculture practices so that we curb the emissions that are generated today in food production. The next sector is industry. How do we reimagine and remake industrial processes and the materials that are all around us? We've got to address refrigerants by preventing the leaks and improving how we dispose of the fluorinated gases that we use in our refrigerators and air conditioning systems. Ultimately, we've got to replace them with better alternatives. We can use waste as a resource, actually moving towards that vision of a truly circular economy. And then improving critical materials or finding replacements for them, for plastic, for cement. Project Drawdown has actually assessed a relatively limited set of solutions in the industry sector to date, but even still you can see how much opportunity sits here. Within transport, Right, again, mobility today largely depends on petroleum. So the question is, how can we reshape and reimagine the way that we move people and things? That means shifting to alternative modes of mobility. This is a big opportunity. 
public transit, walking, biking, or the ability to simply stay put, but still connect in the ways that we need to. Enhancing the efficiency of vehicles that continue to use internal combustion engines, kind of an interim solution set. And then also electrifying vehicles so that we can replace petroleum ideally with renewable energy. Buildings, huge electricity users, but also users of energy in their own right, burned for heating of space and water and the like. How do we transform our existing buildings and our new ones? We shift energy sources, the fuels that we burn in our buildings. Uh, how do we move those away from fossil fuels? How, again, do we enhance efficiency of the building envelope and of every component within it, lights, heat, cooling, appliances? And addressing refrigerants also comes back into play here. At the same time that we do all of these things, we have to actively stop the sources of the problem. That means shutting down coal plants. It means moving away from fossil fuel production, rigs, wells, pipelines, refineries, not only because of their climate impacts, but because of the disproportionate impacts they're having on poorer communities and communities of color and indigenous communities. Then we come to the other side of the equation, back to that rainbow visual. The solutions that we have to actually bring carbon back home and help do some of that rebalancing. The big, big opportunity that we have here is around land sinks. How do we re-green the planet and actually sequester more carbon in biomass and soil? One of the things that doesn't get talked about enough here is shifting agriculture practices to actually regenerate soil and adopt agroforestry practices like silvopasture that integrate trees into our food system. Protecting and restoring ecosystems such as forests, peatlands, grasslands, letting them do what they do best. And then using degraded lands in ways that can actually revive it and sequester carbon. We see also opportunities in coastal and ocean ecosystems. How do we support carbon sequestration at sea and along our marine and coastal areas? That means protecting and restoring ecosystems like mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows. It means shifting agriculture practices to regenerative farming methods. Again, we've done at Project Drawdown a relatively limited uh, set of research around these solutions to date, but we're working actively around coastal and ocean solutions, and we'll, there will be a big expansion of this work to come. Engineered sinks. This is a very nascent burgeoning area where we're asking, how can humans actually augment nature's processes? Can we remove and store carbon uh, from the atmosphere, for example, through biochar production. And then the third area of this cartography of solutions, improve society, right? Climate and social systems are profoundly connected in so many ways. That's why we care about the climate crisis. It's why the climate crisis is a crisis and not simply a natural phenomenon unfolding. And we've looked to date at really one major nexus in this space, which is the intersection of health and education and climate. Universal access to high quality, inclusive education and also high quality, voluntary reproductive health care. These are fundamental human rights and they are cornerstones of gender equality. Their ripple effects are myriad, including planetary ripple effects. And that includes some direct impact on emissions, which you can see here. If you're keen to dig deeper into this work, I can't recommend enough the research done by Christina Kwok at the Brookings Institution. There's much, much more detail about the individual solutions and all of their uh, opportunity and the assumptions sitting behind this research. All of that is available on our website at drawdown.org, as well as in the Drawdown Review. But really, the most important takeaway is that we already have most of the solutions that we need. 
from regenerative farming to renewable electricity, restored ecosystems, redesigned mobility, materials, and structures, we have such an incredible toolbox of solutions. We don't have to wait for new technology and new practices. We really just need to get to it. It's also really critical to understand these solutions as a system, perhaps as an ecosystem. They are deeply connected and all of them are needed. It will take all of these solutions and then some working together to actually reach that point of drawdown. And though it's quite ambitious, what you see here is that scenario one doesn't reach drawdown until the mid 2060s. We would see the concentration of greenhouse gases rise to about 540 parts per million just by mid-century. Scenario two is bolder and it has much more pervasive and swift adoption of solutions. And that actually does reach drawdown in the mid 2040s. We would see those concentrations of greenhouse gases peak at around 490 parts per million, and then actually begin to fall slightly by 2050. When we translate the scenarios into their impacts on global temperature change, which of course is where the rubber hits the road, we see that scenario two actually charts a path to keep warming to roughly 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's the more ambitious and necessary target that was set out in the Paris Agreement. In scenario one, we'd be more on a path to roughly two degrees of temperature rise by century's end. So what do we make of all of this? For me, the Drawdown Review and our work at Project Drawdown leaves me with a bit of an emotional paradox. In some ways, uh, a sense of hope for what's possible, but at the same time, a sense of overwhelm about just how much to, needs to be done to realize that possibility. We could avoid truly catastrophic warming with solutions that are already in hand today, but it's going to require immense ambition to bring what's physically possible and what's socio-politically possible into alignment. 